God bless you, my beloved. This is Minister S. N. Crockett Jr. of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Christian Fellowship. We're coming to you today, the 11th of June, 2020. And we're going to continue our study in the uh, epistle of Paul, the letter of Paul to the Ephesian Christians. We're going to start chapter 2 this evening. I'm not going to cover that much. I might cover about five verses. Ephesians chapter 2 has a total, I want to say 22 verses. Ephesians 2 has a total, yep, 22 verses. We'll cover about five verses tonight. I'm running low on power. I just recognize I'm, I'm running low on power. On one of these iPads, it's, it's not keeping its power. It's older, older iPad. So the battery is probably on its last leg. <clears throat> so that's the one. Uh, can't remember if that's the Buffalo feed or if that's my regular feed. But anyway, it may cut off all of a sudden if it does. <clears throat> I, I apologize, but don't worry because I've, I've got a feed going to several Facebook pages and I, as well as recording it for YouTube. So if it cuts off, uh, I'll, 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 put, I'll put it on... Um, after we finish and again it, it may cut off i think it's the buffalo feed but i'm not sure all right but we, anyway let's pray father in the name of the lord jesus christ we thank you we bless you we glorify you we praise you for your magnificent wisdom your magnificence lord you are the only true and living god you are the blessed father of our lord jesus christ you are the god of our glory we pray first we want to praise you and thank you for the witness we've been hearing, the messages we've been hearing, the praise reports we've been hearing, Lord, that you've been sustaining your churches, uh, even though they've been separated because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but we're getting uh, praise reports that you're sustaining your churches, Lord, and that's been our prayer, and we thank you for doing that. We bless you and we praise you. You are faithful. The church is the body of your dear son, Jesus, and so we know you'll be faithful to the body. Even when the body is unfaithful to you, we bless you and we praise you. We thank, we thank you through your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory, power, majesty, and dominion. We pray that as a result of this preaching and teaching, and preaching and teaching, Lord, all over the world, we pray that gifts and fruit of the Holy Spirit would be manifested according to your good, acceptable, and perfect will. And by Jesus' holy and righteous name, amen. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2. Again, I'm not going to go any uh, further tonight than verse 5. Um, because that's as far as I've had a chance to study. Because I've been in the process of moving and um, I've been tied up with that. So we'll do verses 1 through 5 tonight. And then on Sunday at 11 a.m. we will resume. And uh, if, if one of the Facebook feeds cuts off, uh, I, I will post it from another feed. I'll post it uh, onto YouTube by, uh, before I go to bed tonight, <clears throat> as well as it's being um, recorded through Anchor Podcasting. All right, God bless you. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. I'm reading out of the NASB, the New American Standard Bible. Among them, we too all, all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespass, in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Just a brief overview. Paul is speaking to the Ephesian Christians. And the main theme of Ephesians is the unity of the uh, church. But another predominant idea in Ephesians is uh, the foreordained plan of God, the predestined or predestinated plan plan of God. It's a very uh, it's it's spoken of several times in Ephesians, just in chapter one, which we just finished. 
And uh, I know it's a very tricky, very controversial subject. And I certainly don't claim to be an expert on the subject. But I will say this, that God is sovereign and that God knows everything from the beginning to the end. And so because he knows everything from the beginning to the end, he has the power to uh, foreordain things. Let me read the scripture that I've been reading uh, our last few lessons as it relates to God's, um, we say he's omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. Om, omni, all. Uh, science is where we get the word knowledge. So God is omniscient. So he has all knowledge. We don't have all knowledge. I can't tell you what's going to happen five, ten minutes from now. I don't know. There could be a meteor hit the earth or something. I don't know. The, the president could be, you know, could get, they could come on the news and say, uh, he's, yeah, he's had a heart attack or he, he's, uh, he has the coronavirus. I don't know. But listen to what the Lord says about, the, about himself in Isaiah 46. I'm going to start at verse 9, but verse 10 is the one I really want to uh, emphasize. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning. Declaring the, is he, things are new to us, they're not new to God. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the, the things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God, nothing surprises God. There are no coincidences with God. There are coincidences with us. Because we're human, we're finite. There are no coincidences with God. Nothing catches him by surprise. God never says, oh, I didn't know that was... No, we say that. Oh, I didn't know such and such. Oh, I didn't know you were going to wear the same uh, red clergy shirt that I'm, I'm wearing, you know, on the second Sunday. I didn't know that. What a coincidence. That, that's a... That's because we're finite. We don't have unlimited knowledge. We are not omniscient. God is omniscient. The true and living God, he's omniscient. He knows all. There's nothing that catches him by surprise. And so our salvation was foreordained by God. If you go back to chapter one, I wish I could go back and read it to you, but uh, I've got to move on here. But go back and read Ephesians chapter one. It talks about uh, it uses word like words like predestinated, foreordained before the foundation of the world. That's a prominent expression in the New Testament. Foreordained before the foundation of the world. Uh, God uh, foreordained, uh, predestinated. Pre meaning before. God knew. God knew Adam and Eve was going to sin. We're going to sin. He didn't make them sin, but he knew they would. Because he's God. He has all, uh, Adam and Eve didn't sin, and then God said, Oh, my Lord. Well, he couldn't say, oh, my Lord, because there's no, there's no Lord above him. But, but God didn't say, oh, I didn't know Adam and Eve were going to sin. What am I going to do? No. Christ was ordained before the foundation of the world. The Lamb of God, the Bible calls him slain from the foundation of the world, meaning the crucifixion, the sacrifice of Jesus at Calvary's cruel cross was no afterthought. God didn't say, what am I going to do? Now i got to come up with a plan here. Jesus is the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. So nothing catches God by surprise. All right. So Ephesians, let's see if we can do five verses, and then we'll pick up on Sunday. Okay, I just read the first five verses, so here we go. All right, we have been quickened. The King James says quickened. The NASB says made alive. The new King James is going to say uh, you, he made alive. And he made alive is in italics, meaning it wasn't in the original Greek manuscript. All right. So if I were to read it without the italics it, in the in the new King James, it says, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins. And that's what it says in the NASB. So when you see words in the King James that are in italics in the New Testament, uh, they weren't in the original manuscripts. They were added for clarification's sake. All right. So King James uses the word quickened. You have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. See, we were born. I was born March the 4th, 1957. But my spirit was dead because of trespasses and sins. My spirit was dead because of the sin of, of Adam. Let me read to you Romans chapter 5, verse 12.
Paul says in Romans 5, 12, he says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And because death passed upon all, for all have sinned, that means our spirit was dead. I was born March 4th, 1957, but my spirit was dead. I was dead in trespasses and sin. I might have been the cutest baby in the world, but my spirit was dead in trespasses and sins. So when God saves us through Jesus Christ, he saves our spirit initially. He saves our spirit. And then as we begin to walk with him, he saves our mind. Our, we're, we're renewed, we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. As we walk with him, this is the sanctification process that takes place. And then when he comes to get us in the resurrection, what we call the rapture, he'll save our body. He will redeem our body. The Bible says this mortal shall put on immortality and this uh, corruptible shall put on incorruption. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, uh, John 14, where the Lord said, if I go, I'll return again and receive you unto myself, etc. That where I am there, you may be also. So when you, so when you first get saved, he saves your spirit. Then as you walk with the Lord, as we walk with the Lord, he saves our mind. The salvation really has three phases to it. We, we were saved. We are being saved. We shall be saved. We were saved. We are being saved. Present progressive is or our plus ing. We were saved. We are being saved. We shall be saved. My spirit was saved on March on, on May 20th, 1979. My mind now is being saved. That's why Paul told the Romans, I believe it was the Romans, he said, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's where our mind is being saved, the process of sanctification. But now we're living in this body and the Bible says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither can corruption inherit incorruption. So the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and in 430, it says that the Holy Spirit has sealed us until the day of redemption. So when the Lord comes to get us, that is the day of redemption. That's when he saves our body. This mortal shall put on immortality. Remember Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, And may your entire spirit what did he say? I think he said spirit. I think he said spirit, soul, and body. But see, the word soul comes from the Greek word psyche, where we get the word psychology. Uh, that's the mind. So Paul said, may your entire spirit, soul, and body be preserved unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I was saved on May 20th, 1979. My spirit came alive. I was quickened by the Holy Spirit. You can't get saved unless the Holy Spirit quickens you. It doesn't matter if 80 bishops are standing around you, laying hands on you and pouring gallon, gallons of oil on you. You cannot be saved or quickened except it be by the Holy Spirit because salvation is a working of the Holy Spirit in the heart of men and women and children. And so I was saved on May 20th, 1979. And now as I walk with the Lord for these past 40, 41 years, my mind, I'm being sanctified. I'm being formed into the image, conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. My mind is being saved. I'm moving further and further and further away from, from, that, from the first Adam. And I'm moving closer and closer and closer. I used to call him the second Adam. You know how you can think something is right for years? The Bible doesn't call Jesus the second Adam. The Bible calls Jesus the last Adam. But for years, I, I said the second, I probably heard somebody else, some preacher or something say the second Adam. The Bible calls Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15, the last Adam. So as, as, as we uh, become more and more like Jesus and less and less like ourselves, we become less like the first Adam who sinned in the garden. Sinned willfully, actually. Eve was deceived. Adam sinned willfully. We become, and then we, we become more and more like Jesus the last Adam. So our mind is being renewed. And then when Jesus comes to redeem this body, you know, I'm taking 800 uh, milligrams of ibuprofen because I hurt my hip and my back. Uh, I'm moving and I'm, I'm cleaning out the garage and stuff. 
But when Jesus comes to redeem, redeem me, I'm not going to need any ibuprofen, Tylenol, codeine, oxycodone. Uh, I'm not going to need any of that because I won't be in this mortal body. I'll be in an immortal. The Bible says the corruptible shall put on incorruption. incorruption. But anyway, so we've been quickened. We've been made alive. We were dead. We were dead. A person who's not saved is dead. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be quickened, Nicodemus. You must be quickened. You, you must be made alive, Nicodemus. I know you're a scholar. I know that you know the law forward and backward. And, and, and you sat at the feet of Gamaliel or you sat at the feet of one of the great, you know, or some of the great Jewish rabbis. And, and Nicodemus, you are a scholar. But remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus. He said, are you not a leader of Israel and you don't know these things? So Nicodemus, you must be born again. And then Jesus said to him, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit or spiritual. So to be born again means to be born of the Holy Spirit. I was born in, uh, uh, as a result. I was initially born as the result. And you were initially born as the result of the union of your father and your mother. Your father and your mother made love. About nine months later, and your father's seed impregnated your mother's egg. And about nine months later, you were born. Well, now the Bible says when we're born again, we're born of incorruptible seed, not corruptible seed. My father's seed is corruptible because he's a descendant of Adam, like we all are. But when I was born again, when you were born again, you were born of the seed. The Bible calls the word of God, the incorruptible seed of God that lives and abides forever. And then Peter goes on to quote Isaiah, for all flesh is as grass. My daddy's dead. My mother's dead. All flesh is as grass. I could die tonight. I could die tomorrow. All flesh is as grass. All the glory of man is as the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades away for the breath of the Lord blows on it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So when you're born again, you will abide forever because you've been born of that incorruptible seed. So he says, he says in Ephesians, he says, we have been quickened, made alive. We were dead in trespasses and sins. I told you about Romans 5, 12, Romans 3, 23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? Genesis chapter three is where Adam and Eve sinned and God evicted them, gave, it, gave them an eviction notice. Get out. He got evicted them from the Garden of Eden, but he promised redemption. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned, they made some fig leaves. They sewed fig leaves together. They tried to cover their sins by their own efforts. And man is still doing it today. He's trying to cover his sins by his own efforts. Fig leaves. God demands more than fig leaves. God demands a sacrifice. And that sacrifice was his dear son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So remember, before God evicted them from the garden, he, 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 he made them, uh, he, he killed an animal. We don't know who the animal was. The Bible doesn't say, it doesn't have to say. But God killed an animal. It had to be God. He killed him because there were no other humans on the earth at that time. God killed an animal. And he, he, he clothed Adam and Eve. It covered their sin. It did not wash their sins away. For the blood of an animal cannot... Uh, um, uh, wash away the sins of a human being because humans are made in the image of God. Only a man could wash away man's sins. And that man who washed away the sins could not be any man. It certainly couldn't be me. And it certainly couldn't be you. It had to be the perfect man, the God man. That's right. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. All right. So uh, we have been quickened and made alive. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but now through God's inestimable grace, We've been saying that grace is G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense, meaning Jesus paid it all. We've been born again. We've been made alive by the exact same Holy Spirit. Paul says in Ephesians chapter one, by the same Holy Spirit who faithfully raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. We are saved by the same Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. That Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who raised Jesus from the dead, quickened us. King James quickened us. NASB made us alive because we were, we were dead in trespasses and sins. And the Greek word for dead is nekros, 
where we get the word uh, like like a, a necrophilia, a person who has a sickness of wanting to have sex with the, with dead people. Necrophilia. Uh, if something in the body is necrotic, you know, sometimes uh, athletes get injured. And if, if that part of the body that was injured um, loses its blood supply, uh, that part of the body, it could be the knee, it becomes necrotic. And so the Greek word for dead is necros. We were dead. We were necrotic. We were dead in trespasses and sins. And then I looked up the word trespasses. It means to pass by. So I have to believe in my limited knowledge of Greek that we passed by the, the limits that God had set for us because the Greek word for trespasses is to pass by. So we were dead in trespasses. We trespassed into areas that God did not give us permission to trespass into. Remember he told Adam and Eve, you may eat of every tree of the knowledge of good. Uh, you, you may eat of every tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and of good, of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. He didn't mean physically die because they didn't physically die. They went on and had children and, and raised children and, you know, retired and, and 401k and all that. But they died spiritually and plunged mankind into the abyss of, of sin when they sinned. But the Greek word for trespasses means to pass by. So we, we passed by uh, and, and apparently we, we must have passed into areas that God did not give us permission, especially Adam and Eve initially did not uh, give us permission to pass into. All right. So we were dead in trespasses and sins. All right. We were, it says here, um, that we were walking according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. And the, the Greek word for prince is uh, the power of the air is a ruler. He's the first ruler, meaning he's, he's not talking about just some uh, subordinate demon. We, he's talking about the, the big one, Satan, the prince. Jesus is the prince of peace. Jesus is the prince of princes. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. John called him the, the God of this world, it's lowercase g-o-d. God called him the, John called Satan the God of this world. So before we got saved, we were in slavery. If you look at 2 Timothy 2, I believe it's 21 and 22, we were in slavery. We were on Satan's plantation. And Jesus freed us from Satan's plantation. We were dead in trespasses and sins and because of God's grace, which Paul talks about uh, in, uh, in chapter two here, we have been freed from satanic bondage, not because of what we've done, but because of God's grace, because of the moving and the working of the Holy Spirit. All right. So anyway, so the word for uh, Satan, the, the ruler of darkness, he says in chapter six, the ruler of the darkness of this world, right? John called him the God of this world. Here, we were walking according to the prince of the power of the air. And this prince, Satan has an organized kingdom. Jesus said he did. Here, Paul calls him the prince of the power of the air, who, who exercises exousia, authority. Satan has authority. I'm not glorifying Satan. I'm telling you, he's not just on a can of, of Underwood deviled ham. Or as a preacher I used to be with down in Macon, he said some people think the devil's just on a can of potash. No, he's not just on a can of potash. Satan has an organized kingdom. And Jesus said his kingdom has three purposes, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. So Paul right here is saying that we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were walking according to the ruler of this world, of this age. Satan is the ruler of this age. Now you say, well, I thought Jesus died on the cross to end all that. Yes, Jesus did defeat Satan at the cross. But the fullness of his complete defeat has not yet been manifested. God has a fullness of time for everything. And I always use the analogy of a sporting event. If a team is winning 50 to 3, the game still has to be played. A team could be winning Remember the Atlanta Falcons were beating the New England Patriots 28 to 3 in the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 51 to be exact. Everybody was dancing and doing the uh, the nay nay and, and the bump, etc. And I said, I remember saying this, uh, this game is not over yet. 
because number one, these are the New England Patriots. Number two, these are the New England Patriots. This game's not over yet. And guess what? If, if suppose the referees had said twenty-eight to three, that's it. No. And so the game was played, and the Patriots came back and won. Well, Jesus did defeat Satan at the cross, but God is still God still has a plan that must be uh, fulfilled. There are prophecies that have to be fulfilled, etc. And so God has a fullness of time for everything. There are basically two words for time in the Bible. There are more than two, but the, the two that are probably used the most, most, especially in the New Testament, are kairos time and chronos time. And chronos time is where we get the word chronology. And so God has a fullness of time. Yes, Satan was defeated at the cross, but God has not yet cast him into the lake of fire. He won't be cast into the lake of fire until... Uh, after the um, after the millennial kingdom, if you read Revelation chapters twenty and twenty one, Satan uh, will be eventually, but it hasn't happened yet. He will eventually be cast into the lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophet already will be. So God has a fullness of time. Yes, Jesus did. The Bible says he triumphed over principalities and powers, etc. He did defeat Satan at the cross, but God is still allowing Satan to wreak havoc, if you will, because God has a plan. I know I know, our finite minds don't understand that it's like God, you know, let's, let's get this devil out of here and, and let's all sing Kumbaya and, and live for eternity. God has a fullness of time. He's sovereign. There's nothing There's nothing we can do about it. God is sovereign. He, he allows things to happen that we don't understand and that we won't understand until, you know, until we meet him face to face. And, and by then it really won't matter. I, I watch a doc. I was watching a documentary on World War II. Uh, I like to watch uh, uh, documentaries on uh, World War II, Vietnam, the Civil War, because I love history. There were five assassination attempts against Hitler. <laughs> None of them were successful. Five assassination. The most well known was Valkyrie. That that was the Tom Cruise movie on July twentieth, nineteen forty four. I believe it was. There were five assassination attempts against Adolf Hitler. You might say, well, Lord, you know, why did you allow Adolf Hitler to, you know, take him out? I, we, God, God has a fullness of time. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't pretend to understand it. I just know he's God and I'm not. I, I have to leave it at that. Otherwise, I lose my mind. But there were five assassination attempts against Hitler. None of them were successful. He didn't die until he, he, he shot himself and his girlfriend. Uh, well, he eventually married Ava Braun. She took a cyanide pill. They shot their dog. She took a cyanide pill. Hitler shot himself, killed himself, kind of like Jim Jones. He killed himself. But there were five assassination attempts. My point is, you would think somebody as evil as Hitler, you know, the assassination attempts would have been successful. But God, allow, God, God allows the he allow he often allows evil people to live long lives. One of the most wicked kings in the Bible, Manasseh, ruled for 50, 55 years. So go figure, right? So Satan has been defeated, but God is still allowing Satan to uh, to um, exist along with his kingdom because Jesus has a full God. Jesus, God, God, Jesus has a fullness of time, and the fullness and in the fullness of time, God's will will be done. And Jesus said, "The scriptures can't be broken." John ten thirty five. The scriptures cannot by you mean nobody. The scriptures cannot be broken. God's will will be done. All right, so the Bible says that we were walking according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that even now works in the children or the sons, the Greek says the sons of disobedience. And the Greek word for uh, working is where we get the word energy. Satan is is working, is, 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 is using energy, his energy to work in the sons of disobedience. Like that cop that, that had his knee on that man's neck. That wasn't Jesus. <laughs> that, that, that was the devil. That was the devil influencing that man to have that man have his knee on that man's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. So Satan is working in the children of disobedience. If that cop had been a spirit filled Christian, he wouldn't have done that. Not a spirit, not a spirit filled Christian. Now a church goer, he might have done that. That cop might be a member of a church. I don't know. But a spirit-filled Christian would not have done that. And the way I'm understanding now, I think it was kind of personal because they had both worked security at a nightclub. There, there may have been something personal there, but I don't know those details, so I won't go into detail. 
But that cop had his knee on that man's neck for almost nine minutes. If that, if that cop had been a spirit-filled Christian, he wouldn't have done that. He would have been a cop and he would have arrested the man and let's take this man away because he passed a $20 counterfeit bill or whatever his alleged crime was. But a spirit-filled Christian wouldn't have his knee on somebody's neck. Not for, no, no. So my point is, the Bible says that Satan is, uh, uh, is working in and through. And the Greek word is where we get the word energy. He's working in and through the children, the sons, of disobedience and the Greek word for disobedience is unbelief rebellious obstinate people unbelief unbelieving rebellious obstinate people Satan is working in the rebellious on the unbelieving if you read 2nd Corinthians if you read 2nd Corinthians I'll read it right now if you read 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. And, and remember what I said about, uh, about uh, what uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 2. It says Satan is working in, the, in, the, in the, his energy. He's, he's directing his energy toward the children of disobedience. Obstinate, rebellious, self-willed against God. All right? Let me read it one more time. I lost my page here. Let me read it one more time. Obstinate. Unbelief, unbelieving, rebellious. You remember how you were rebellious and I was rebellious and obstinate and unbelieving before we got saved? And then we didn't decide to get saved one day because of our own intellect. God's mercy shined upon us. Our salvation is, a com is completely a working of the grace of God, the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Don't you dare ever think that your intellect, you, and you decided to get saved one day. It is our salvation is purely by grace. It is a working of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit does not enlighten us to the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ, we would not be enlightened. You can you can put on an Easter dress, an Easter suit. You can stand around 80 preachers with a collar on. Remember, Jesus had 12 apostles. And one of them was with Jesus for three years and still and still um, 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 betrayed him. So if there's not a working of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of people, you can be in the presence of Jesus Christ himself and still sell him for 30 pieces of silver, which is the price of a, uh, that, that one had to pay for a dead slave. If you killed somebody's slave ac accidentally, you had to pay 30 pieces of silver. So if, there, if there's not a moving of the Holy Spirit, that's why God said in Zechariah, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. There has to be a moving of the Holy Spirit. There has to be a moving of the Holy Spirit. We spend a lot of energy trying to um, duplicate the Holy Spirit, counterfeit the Holy Spirit. It's all for naught. Unless there's a working of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of men, women, and children, nothing of value to God happens. Let me read what Paul said to the Ephes to the Corinthians here concerning uh, um, Satan's um, directing his energy toward, un toward the unbelieving. Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world, lowercase g-o-d, he said the same thing to the Ephesians, right? In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. He's almost saying the exact same thing to the Corinthians that he said to the Ephesians. You have he quickened. You were dead in trespasses and sins, right? In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, that is the only thing that can save us, the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ shining in our hearts. A moving of the Holy Spirit. There has to be a moving of the Holy Spirit. I know we tried to push the Holy Spirit out of the church. We've pushed the Holy Spirit out of the church and, and we've tried to take the Holy Spirit's place with our programs and our traditions. And, uh, uh, and, and Jesus is knocking on the door of the church in Laodicea saying, um, I want to I want to fellowship with y'all. I behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now it's his church. And Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock, knock, knock. We often use that scripture as evangelism toward the lost. Jesus is knocking on the door of the church. You know, can Jesus join us? I mean, do we mind, you know, can Jesus join us? 
because the church of the Laodiceans, they thought they had it going on with their prosperity and their website and their programs and their buses and their social activity in the community. And Jesus said, y'all blind, you know, wretched, naked, and, and uh, but, but I love you. And if you let me fellowship with you, uh, as the song said years ago, we can straighten this out. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Then Paul says, we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. The worst thing you can do is preach yourself. The Holy Spirit is going to say, exit stage right. We preach ourselves or our programs or our denomination. The Holy Spirit's going to say exit stage right. Y'all let me know when y'all ready to preach Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit says. And I'll come back and I'll work miracles. I'll manifest myself in fruit and gifts of the Holy Spirit. But as long as y'all preaching yourselves and reverend so-and-so and bishop so-and-so and apostle so-and-so and, -so and uh, you know, Mother's Day uh, committee and, and uh, all these anniversaries and all these programs that are counterfeit. There has to be a moving of the Holy Spirit for salvation. All right, let me go to verses three and four. It says in verses three and four, among them, we too all formerly lived. Notice Paul says we. He doesn't sit in a seat of self-righteousness. Y'all, y'all were dead in trespasses and sin. Look at y'all those sinners. Paul says we. He says among whom all we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as, uh, uh, even as others, even as the rest, the NASB says. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. And I'm going to stop there because that's, the, that's verse four. All right. So we all, we all conducted ourselves in the lust. John says there's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. We all conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. When Eve looked at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the Bible says she looked at it, the lust of the eyes, she saw it was good for food, the lust of the flesh, and it was a tree to make one wise, the pride of life. She wanted to go beyond what God had uh planned for her. She wanted to, she wanted to move beyond the, the parameters that God had set for her and for Adam. She trespassed. It's like you going on to somebody's property without that person's permission. You have trespassed. No trespassing, right? Trespassers will be persecuted, prosecuted, shot, or whatever. So we all conducted ourselves in the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind. Remember I told you when you got saved, God saved your spirit. And he's currently saving our mind. And he will eventually save our body. Spirit, soul, psyche, mind, and body. Right? We were by nature. Paul said we were by nature. You didn't, you weren't born and then become a sinner when you uh, became 18. No. We were by nat we were naughty by nature. We were we were by nature because of Romans five and twelve by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and death passed upon all for all have sinned. We were by nature the children. Watch this of wrath. Paul says even as others. Go back to John three thirty six when you get a chance. He who believes in the Son has life. He he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. People today don't believe there's a wrath of God. They're calling God a liar. They're calling God's word a liar. Well, they don't believe the Bible is the word of God. So that's, that, that, that answers that. So people don't believe that, that, that God has wrath. People only want to believe, if they believe in God at all, if they believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at all, they want to believe that, oh, he's a God of, he's only a God of love. And, you know, God is love. Yeah, he's love. God is love, but he's also a God of wrath. He has wrath. And, the, and anybody who has not given their life to Jesus, the wrath of God, John 3 and 36, abides on others. All right, we were walking in the lust. 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 <laughs> and it's not just sex. That's part of it, but it's not just sex. Longing, this is the Greek definition. Longing for what is forbidden. What does that, what does that sound like? It sounds like Eve, Adam and Eve. 
longing for what is forbidden. Uh, the King James uses the word concupiscence. 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 Inordinate desire. Inordinate, the King James uses the word inordinate affection. That means to have a fixation. You can have a fixation on a person. Or you can have a fixation on a thing. Inordinate affection. I think one word for it, we call them a fetish. Inordinate affection. Right? The lust of the flesh. Sarkos. The lust of the mind. Right? We were by nature. Uh, we were by nature. Uh, um, the, uh, we were going to be the objects of God's wrath. Of God's anger. And then I'm going to do verse 4. But God. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love. See that? God is love. Yeah, God is love, but God is not a... When you, when you make pancakes, do you just cook one side of the pancake? No, you cook both sides of the pancake. Well, God is a two-sided... I hate to compare God to a pancake, but God is a two-sided pancake. Don't just cook the one side of the pan. I like to cook grill, grilled cheese sandwiches. I can't just cook the one side of the grilled cheese. I got to flip it and cook the other side. God is not a one-sided grilled cheese sandwich. I hate to compare God to a grilled cheese sandwich. Please forgive me, Lord. But the analogy is clear. God is love, but he has wrath. But those of us who have given our lives to Jesus, we have escaped the wrath of God. We shall never suffer the wrath of God. The Bible says so. Those of us who have trusted in Christ through what he did at, at, at the cross, and the fact that God bodily raised him from the dead, we shall never experience the wrath of God. The Bible says so. We shall never experience the wrath of God. We can experience the discipline of God. If we get out of line, God disciplines us as a father does his children. But because we belong to Jesus, we will never suffer the wrath of God. We've been delivered from the wrath of God. We don't, we don't stand at the, at the judgment, um, at, the, at the great white throne judgment. We don't stand at that. We stand at the judgment seat of Christ to receive rewards for the things we've done as Christians. We don't stand at the judgment seat of Christ to be judged for what we did before we became Christians. That was already judged at the cross. So as a Christian, you will never experience the wrath of God. At, at, the, at the worst case scenario, you will, and I know this because I've experienced it, you will experience the disciplining hand of, of God if you get out of line as a Christian. God brings you back in line through his discipline and he's able to discipline but unbelievers, if they don't get saved, they will experience the wrath of God. John 3 and 36 and a bunch of other places. All right. But God, rich in mercy, right? He loved us even when we were necros, dead. Remember I said necros, necroscopy, necrotic. The, the great football player, Bo Jackson, out of, out of Auburn University. Great football player, Bo. You, you, if you remember those commercials from back in the day, Bo knows football, Bo knows whatever. Bo Jackson, he, he was playing for the Oakland Raiders and he got tackled and he had a hip injury where the socket in the hip, where the socket, where the leg, the upper thigh uh, meets the hip. But it never did, it never did heal properly because the blood supply was never reestablished properly. So that part of his hip became necrotic because you know that whatever part of your body does not receive an adequate blood supply, what did God say in Leviticus 17, 11? The life of the flesh is in the blood. So whatever part of our body does not receive an adequate blood supply, it dies. That's why the man with his knee on the man's neck the man died because his brain was not receiving blood. And you know, after a couple of minutes, that show is over. And so Bo Jackson, because for some reason, I don't know why, but for some reason, because the blood supply was never reestablished properly to that part of his hip, it became necrotic. He had to retire. He was like 25, 26 years old when he, when he retired because he never could Right, it's like it's like the player for the Atlanta Falcons, Julio Jones. He broke his foot 
a few years ago. And the doctors were worried that part of the, his foot was not getting that adequate blood supply. And it, apparently they reestablished it because he's still playing. But if, if that part of the foot had not reestablished the adequate blood supply, that part of the foot would have been necrotic, died. So the Greek word here is, we were dead. We were corpses. It's the, Greek, it's the word for a corpse. We were dead. And, be, and you know, God doesn't like hanging around dead stuff. For I seek ye the living among the dead. God doesn't like hanging around dead stuff. God, like Jesus said himself, he's the God of the, he's not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living. For all live unto him. So God doesn't like hanging around dead stuff. We were dead in trespasses and sins. And he saved us. He made us alive. He quickened our spirit. Now he's saving our mind. And see, for him to save our mind, we have to bend our will to his will. But he's saving our mind, the psyche. He's saving our mind. He's sanctifying us day by day, day by day, day by day. He's sanctifying us. He's saving our mind. But we still live in this body. This old earthly tabernacle is getting older. As the old deacon used to say, my head is blooming for the grave. My feet steps are getting short. My eyes are getting dim. See, I need these eyes. I need these glasses to read. I don't need, if it's not for reading, I don't need glasses. I can see Jupiter almost. <laughs> but, it's, but it's when I'm looking at stuff close up, like words, I gotta have, these, I gotta have glasses. Why? Because my body Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But the Bible says there's a day of redemption coming. The Bible says we've been sealed. That's why we know our salvation is eternal. We've been sealed. God has sealed us until the day of redemption. And no one can unseal us. No, no pope, no prelate, no bishop, no cardinal, no apostle, no demon. What did Paul say? Death, life, angels, principalities, powers. Things to come, Romans 8. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Glory to the Lamb of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then we shall be, our body shall be redeemed at that great day. Your, your, your mother, your grandmother, your father, your grandfather, your child may have died unexpectedly. When Jesus returns, the Bible says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. He's going to send a shout out. The voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the trump of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'll leave that alone. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Your mama's not rising up in that, that body that went into the ground. Your mama might have died 40 years ago. She's not rising up with that body. That body's corrupted. No, I don't care if that casket costs $10,000. That body is corrupted. My mama died of a major stroke, 2006. She trusted in Christ before she died. I know she did. I have no doubt about it. She trusted in Christ. And I'm not saying it because she's my mother. I'm saying it because I know. And God has even confirmed it since her death. She trusted in Christ. When Christ comes back, he's not raising that body from the dead. He's, he's raising... A new body, because he's bringing her spirit back with him. And he's gonna raise it. that 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 corrupt that that stroke. My mother had a total of probably fifteen strokes at least. The last one is the one that took her out, because it was a and back in the back of the brain. I remember before she died, her heart was beating because that part of the brain that affects breathing, respiration. When Jesus raises her from the dead, when Jesus raises your loved one from the dead, a new body. John said, we don't know what we shall look like, but we know, uh, let me read it to you because I'm, I'm, I'm about to butcher the, I'm about to butcher it. John says in 1 John 3, behold, what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world, remember that, the world, the unbelievers, the obstinate ones, the rebellious ones, the world does not know us because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. He says, now. 
and it does not yet appear what we shall be. Ah, but we know that when he shall appear, he being Jesus, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. When we see Jesus, we shall be like him. That's why Larnell Harris could sing years ago, we shall behold him face to face in all his glory. We shall be like him. He's not taking us back to be with him in this. In this. Paul said flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He said, neither can mortality inherit immortality. Neither can corruption inherit incorruption. So when the Lord comes back for us, and he is coming back, in what we call the rapture, he's coming back for the church, we're going to be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Glory to God. Glory to the Lamb of God. At the last T-R-U-M-P. <laughs> I'm going to preach that one day. The only trump that I love. <laughs> to God. Let me close here. Let me close. Verse 5. Uh, Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We were dead in transgressions. We passed by God's established guidelines. God in Christ by grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense, made us alive together with Christ. With Christ. With Christ. We cannot be made alive without Christ. Jesus said, I'm the true vine. Uh, the man next door cut his tree down. He cut two trees down. I guess they were diseased. And he let them lay out in his yard for about a week. And I noticed every day, Every day, the leaves lost their green more and more and more every day until finally you could tell they were dead because they had been cut down, cut off from their life source. Jesus said, I'm the true vine. Without me, you can do nothing. You have no life. Paul said, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory. God bless you, beloved. We've been made alive together with Christ, for by grace you are saved. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. We'll pick up um, on cha in chapter 2. I'll do a brief review of that on Sunday. And then we will get through, let's just say, verse 10. So we'll do, we'll see if we can get through verse 10. This Sunday, 11 a.m., if you're not already obligated, join us. The truth of the gospel. God bless you. God keep you. Be strong. Uh, keep wearing your mask. Harvard doctor said they're going to have about 100,000 more deaths by the end of August. Keep wearing your mask. I know it's hot out there. I don't like wearing mine. I hate wearing that thing. But I, I got some new masks the other day, and they're, they're, they're a little bit looser. It's, easy, it's easier to breathe. And so, but, you know, okay, it's 90 degrees outside. You got a mask on. Keep wearing your mask. Keep wearing your mask. God bless you. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name. Blessed be your name. Thank you for allowing us to mention your name, the name of your dear son, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, to whom be glory, power, majesty, and dominion. Oh God, I pray that fruit and gifts of the Holy Spirit will be manifested by your good, acceptable, and perfect will. I pray that you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Bless them in every way possible. Thank you, Lord, for protecting and keeping those churches, Lord, even though they've been separated physically. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for the praise reports, God. We know it was you. You're the only true and living God. Blessed be your name, Lord. I pray that I spoke truth, Lord, to your people. I pray that my teaching was accurate, Lord God. If there was any mistake in there, Lord, reveal it unto me. Help me, Lord, to speak truth. Lord, speak the truth in love. Help me not to speak in error. Help me to correctly, Lord, exegete your scriptures, your word, Lord, not my word. Help me not to just put my own opinions in there, Lord, but help me to speak according to the revelation of the Holy Spirit given to the church, to the holy apostles and prophets of your holy son, Jesus, to whom be glory, power, majesty, and kingdom forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, my beloved. Sunday morning, 11 a.m., if you're not already obligated, join us. Please bathe me in prayer. Please bathe me in prayer. Please bathe me in prayer. Continue to pray for the nation as we go through tumultuous times. 
God bless you, my beloved. You take care. Lord willing, we'll see you Sunday morning, Ephesians chapter 2. We'll see if we can get through um, uh, verse 10. All right, take care. Bye-bye.